Hi guys, welcome back to Morant's Rants. Plenty of good information, a little bit of motivation, a whole lot of truth, no financial advice. This is Connecting the Dots Part 17. Yes, we made it. It's a one-take session. No edits, no cuts. I'm going to talk to you about private equity via leverage buyouts and how it all goes down. Now, we've called out Bed Bath & Beyond from the beginning, and sure enough, Bed Bath & Beyond filed for bankruptcy. That's what took me a little bit longer on this video because I really wanted to dive deep into that portion, but I'm looking at the origins of it all and how it leads out to where we are today. And just so you guys know that it's undeniable at this point, there are people out there that would tell you, well, how can you place somebody on a board? That's not even possible. And, you know, there's no such thing as these plants, how they plant their seeds. And I've shown you numerous, numerous examples of that. But we're going to go even deeper than that today. Hopefully you guys get some good information, good education. I'm with you. I learned a lot doing this video. So um, here we go. One take session. Hey, guys, get comfortable. Get a drink. It's going to be a while. All right, and I will take breaks in between, and we'll get it going. So good luck, guys. Let's go. So right here, here's a quote, guys, for you. It says, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards, and that is Steve Jobs. And if you go on to read the quote, he then says, you got to trust your gut, your destiny, and it'll hopefully it'll all connect in the future, and I'm paraphrasing, but I will tell you Steve Jobs has a good point here. I wanted to go and start at the beginning and see exactly how this all happened. How did this happen? How did Apollo happen? How did all these private equity firms end up taking over, you know, numerous companies that people, you know, hold near and dear to their heart, the brands themselves? So uh, let's go ahead and talk about it, how they actually manipulate the weak and or manufacture their outcome. Let's go. So first, of course, guys, is Connecting the Dots Part 17 by myself, Marantz Rants, and this is all about Apollo in a way, but you'll see exactly where this strays to and how we get from point A to point B. Point A being these three gentlemen, it is Josh Harris, Mark Rowan, Leon Black. As you guys can see, Josh Harris, I mean, he's still there. He's still in charge of a lot of things, but Mark Rowan's running the show right now. Leon Black had to stick, take a step back. We've talked about this in all the other videos. Guys, if you guys have not watched 1 through 17, well, 1 through 18, this is 17. I skipped 17 because I was in the middle of making it when other things happened, but if you haven't watched all the other parts, um, you should, but I've changed the direction on the series because I new information came out, or you know, I gathered new information. I got educated on some of the stuff, some of the books I've read, right? The Caesar's Palace Coup, um, things like that, where I'm reading these books and I'm, I'm getting the information and I'm figuring it out, like what's their vantage point or where, what's their place. So that's what you guys see right now. So if you guys want the information in the background on all of this stuff, watch the other videos, but you'll get a gist of it right now. So where do these guys all come from? Well, they come from Drexel Burnham Lambert. Now, Drexel, Burnham, Lambert, what they were, they were one of the most notorious hedge funds in the 80s. They were a small pocket hedge fund, but yet they were doing numerous things. This is Mike Milken here on the screen. In the top left, it looks like he's wearing a wig, because, I mean, obviously, because if you look at him now, it looks like a damn alien. But, uh, you know, he's a, he's a vegan, doesn't eat meat. I don't know what he's doing, but he's a very rich man. This man is worth about $6 billion today, even though he went to prison. He literally still made billions of dollars because the connection between Drexel Burnham Lambert and private equity and the Milken Institute, the way they educate, the way they teach people via the Wharton way. If you guys watch all the videos, you understand the connection here. It runs deep. Now, Mike Milken invented the X desk, right? So he had a desk in the shape of an X. It's actually from an SEC filing here. And he did that so that he could look everyone in the eye. And he he forced everyone to look him in the eye. And as they did the deals, these guys were just trans, you know, they actually transcended the whole era as far as junk bonds. And if you guys know what a junk bond is, it's just a high yield bond, meaning they're willing to loan you out money. And if you can't pay it back, guess what they do? They take over. And that's exactly what was happening. And it's, you know, it's, it's a bad time, bad time in the 80s to go ahead and borrow some money. But the economy forced it that way. Mike Milken's son, Lance Milken, Drexel Burnham Lambert, remember? I'm telling you the connection via Apollo. Worked for Apollo, and as he was with Apollo, he actually was on the board of directors at Chuck E. Cheese. He was on the board of directors at Claire's, uh, numerous companies that we've named in the past, and he was a graduate of the Wharton School uh, for Business So uh, at Penn. So sure enough, here's Lance Milken right here in the picture, and he's the son of Mike Milken. So there's a direct connection. The other Drexel Branham collection, connection to Apollo is right here, Mark Adesato. Mark actually owns the Milwaukee Brewers. I want you to remember that part. Uh, Tony Resler bought the Milwaukee Brewers with them. We've talked about Anthony Resler in the past, guys. He runs Aries Capital. He was one of the founding fathers of Apollo. They all worked at Drexel together. 
Um, Peter Ackman worked at Drexel as well. His son, Jason Ackman, worked at Drexel. Uh, son actually worked for uh, Boss Consulting Group at one point, and Peter Ackman was one of the first investors into a company called Crown Capital. The founder of Crown Capital was this guy, Jeff. I don't know how to say his last name. Dutchman, I don't, I don't know how to say his name, but Jeff actually worked at Apollo, or he is working at Apollo right now. He worked at, with them in the past, but uh, Crown Capital, Apollo, there's a connection even with Peter Ackerman. What I'm trying to show you is that even after they left Drexel, the ties run deep with each other. Robert Breyer, he's out here, and he worked for uh, Drexel Burnham Labor as well. And see this picture here, guys? They all went to the UCLA Anderson School of Management. They literally are all on the board of directors and trustees there. And uh, that's the connection I want to show you as well because the chairman of that trustee board or the alumni is uh, Larry Fink. And he, that is going to be the CEO and chairman of BlackRock. I just want you guys to know that part. Um, like I said, Robert Breyer actually worked directly with Vernon Lambert. If you read it here at the bottom, he worked directly under Mike Milken. Um, well... Like I said, those ties run deep. Oh, by the way, he also was a director at the Kroger, um, at Kroger. And you know who owns Kroger? Anybody know? Yeah, you know who does. Apollo does. And he was there for 10 years at Kroger. Uh, John Sort. John Sort worked for um, Drexel Burnham Lambert. He was also the acting CEO in 1990 when they went under and they went bankrupt. Uh, he's on the board of directors for Vail Resorts. So you see the connection of it, of how they get a director on the board. Michael Gross worked at Apollo. Uh, he founded Apollo. He helped fund, found Apollo as well. And he was with Drexel Burnham Lambert. So was Chris uh, Kenoff, Drexel Burnham Lambert as well, and the UCLA school. And he's with Jeffries. So um, they're connected somehow. John Hannon worked at Drexel Burnham Lambert. And he was at Apollo and Vail Resorts. Yeah, he was the director of Vail Resorts. But he was uh, part of mergers and acquisitions, uh, corporate finance, and managing director at Drexel Burnham Lambert, John Hannon. Uh, right here, Lori, uh, Lorianne Spurge, I believe that's her name. She works at Guggenheim Partners. Now, the thing about Guggenheim Partners is they actually are under investigation by the SEC in 2013 because they believe Mike Milken violated his lifetime ban from securities industry because they were paying him to be um, to give out financial advice, investment advice. Okay, and so they're under uh, the scope, and they still are under the scope today. Um, she was the secretary of Jackson Burnham Lambert, so she's. She's not nice. She's not a good person, apparently. But she's also an executive, if you look at Pennant Park Investment. And Pennant Park Investment was an investment firm built. They were uh, investment advisors. And they were built by Art Penn. And Jose down here is also there. But they were all managing directors at Apollo. So you can imagine the, the uh, connection via Apollo um, with them. Another one is Jonathan Skoloff. John Skoloff here is with uh, Leonard Green and Partners. He went ahead and built that in 1990. And... He was a managing partner in 1990. Uh, with him, and it, if you look at um, LGP, that's what I call him. LGP, they have so many deals with Apollo, it's not even funny, but he's Drexel, right? In addition to being Drexel, he's also at the Maloma Research Alliance. Numerous people are on that board of directors and top donors, where it may be, but you'll see Deborah Black, Leon Black, Evan Baugh. You know, go down the list here. You'll see Richard Ressler, which is Tony Ressler's brother, Anthony Ressler's brother. We talked about him. Mike Milken himself. And then you'll see John Skoloff right here. So they're all in on one thing, right? Whatever it may be. But if you see, LGP has been a part of Neiman Marcus. They've been a part of Sports Authority and David's Bridal. And all those companies have filed for bankruptcy. And if you read the very bottom of the text down here, it's going to tell you. Um, today, there's something like 72 people who used to work for me or work or work under me or work with me at Drexel who are now senior positions at other financial firms. So what is he telling you? What is Mike Milken telling you with that? He knows exactly how many people used to work for him, how many, how many connections he has out there in the financial world. 72 is a lot. That's a big web of people. So when people say, oh, there's all, tie, there's all these ties to Apollo. Well, yeah, because there's all these ties to Mike Milken. And that's the way it works out. That's why he's worth $6 billion today, guys. Um, here's another guy, Arthur, Arthur Bilger. He actually launched Apollo. And he came from Drexel Burnham Lambert, if you guys don't know. And he also, um, he's on the advisory board at the Milken Institute. Uh, right here, Craig uh, Colgo. I don't know how to say his name correctly. I hope I did. But he was one of the founders of Apollo via Drexel Burnham Lambert. And he went ahead and broke off and formed a private equity firm called Pegasus. So be aware of that. And then the last connection I had was Drexel Burnham Lambert to Apollo was Peter P. Copsies. He actually works there. He's been on the board of directors for Apollo um, with, uh, let's see, Chuck E. Cheese, 
He did Carl's New York Hardy's, uh, Claire's, Renna Center, GNC, and Ralph's. And, oh, and Zales. So there you go. He's been on everything with Apollo, and he comes from Drexel Burn Lambert. Now, the witnesses against Milken settles the SEC charges. The witness against Milken at the time when he was charged, and he got charged with insider trading, got charged with um, securities fraud, everything they've done, and he, that's why he's no longer allowed to go. And he went to prison, guys. But David Solomon. Now, David Solomon is the one who actually uh, turned on him. If you guys don't know who David Solomon is, he's actually the chairman and CEO of Goldman Sachs today. So, dirty guy, not doing it the right way. I, You can read all this if you guys want, but um, I'll break it down for you really simple. Um, but here we go. In one transaction, the SEC charged that in 1984, Mr. Milken agreed to hold the debt securities uh, of the charter company, which had previously been purchased by Mr. Solomon, to conceal heavy losses in the investment from Mr. Solomon's clients. Mr. Solomon agreed to pay Drexel for any losses the firm acquired while holding those securities. So this is how they're hiding their assets. Now, guys, if they're willing to do this back then, I know it was the wild, wild west back then, um, they actually kept it in a ledger. They actually kept the difference in a ledger. And if you see here, this all stems from Mr. Boski. If you guys don't remember um, the Ivan Boski story, Ivan Boski is one of the most notorious 1980s failed investors. He he propped it like he was making so much money and he was just doing insider trading. He was offering people bribes just to get insider information and then he would you know, make millions off of it. But when he got caught because he was under investigation, they said, okay, what can you give us? He went ahead and started wearing wiretaps and he started going ahead and getting Mike Milken involved because he said, oh, there's a guy named Mike Milken. He's dirtier than me. And that's what happened here. So there was a guy by the name of Taryn Pizer. Taryn Pizer, who used to work for Drexel, worked directly under Mike Milken. He used to keep the ledger, okay? And it would tell you the difference as in what's owed to David Solomon, what's not. Are they plus or minus? And that's how they kept track of all the finances in this one ledger, in this one book. Well, unfortunately, the ledger was never recovered. Mr. Mike and told Mr. Pizer to give the ledger to an associate, and it was never recovered. Now, here is the guy, Taryn Pizer. If you guys don't know who Taryn Pizer is, he's a flat-out criminal. Just got charged with insider trading, and uh, I believe it was March 1st, 2023, just right now. And if you read the fine text, it tells you that he knew the, they were going to have a, so he had negative information relating to his investment, and he went and sold the shares via another company. And of course, they caught him. And well, what, what are you doing, Drexel? What are you doing, Drexel, Burnham, Lambert? You guys are all dirty, and this is one of them, okay? Um, he used to work formerly. He worked for Mike Milken, and he turned on Mike Milken. Uh, he went in and testified against him. Okay, and ultimately testified against his former boss, Mike Milken, in securities fraud uh, prosecution in exchange for immunity. Yeah, well, how long did that last you? About 30 years because now you're caught. Um, I want to show you guys this part because Drexel Burnham Lambert actually hired the SEC chief, John Shad, in 1989. John Shad was the one who prosecuted Mike Milken and along with Rudy Giuliani and then comes out and he ends up going to work for them in 1989. What, what the hell, right? Um, I'm telling you guys, numerous hedge funds do this where they hire the heads of the SEC just so they know how to navigate the law. And so it's like, hey, I got one of your guys on my side now, so we must be doing the right thing over here. So, yeah, you can be bought. That's my point. Had that ever been done before? Absolutely. Um, Drexel Burnham Lambert actually hired the previous SEC chief in the 70s by the name of Roderick M. Hills. Roderick M. Hills is married to Carla Hills, Carla Anderson Hills. Carla Anderson Hills was uh, a two-time uh, delegate. She's actually on, she was a cabinet member for General, General Ford and I want to say Bush administration, the first Bush, Herman Walker Bush. So she's been there before in the political light. In addition to that, she stepped down from Time Warner Cable and Ted Turner in 2006. So she was on the board of directors of Time Warner Cable and she was on the, or Time Warner Inc. and with Ted Turner. The, pro the reason why I have a problem with that is because her husband worked for Drexel. Right. Drexel gave funding to Ted Turner. She was on the board of directors for Ted Turner. Like if I even tell you guys like how this is all connected, it gets deeper than that. But because of you look at the CBS deal, Ted Turner was trying to buy out CBS. They told them, do not buy CBS out. And I know why now, now that I really read this and go ahead and get the MGM grand uh, deal done. And why they do that so he can get his own channels on TNT and go that route. But we'll talk about that in a minute because I have an idea about CBS. But I know who owns CBS. That's why it's the Tish the Tish family at the time. 
or and or they made a huge investment into it back in the 80s or 70s. I read about it in a book. We'll keep going. Uh, junk lives on. Uh, right here, Drexel collapses in 1990, which was February 13th, the day before Valentine's Day. They call it Bloody Valentine, 1990. And what happened? Absolutely nothing, because Mike Milken still exists, and he's still giving out the information, and they're still influenced, and they've increased drastically. That's 2013. Can you imagine what the chart looks like now? It's crazy. Uh, Mr. Black, how you doing? He's 41 years old when he launched Apollo. And when they launched Apollo, they had Vail Resorts, they had Converse, and they had some chicken plant. And... That tells you how much they had. They had $4 billion in cash and securities, and they had controlling interest of almost eight, up to $8 billion. Um, Guys, they're at $540 billion. <laughs> It is a crazy number. Uh, but even their son, Josh Black, Joshua Black, uh, works at Apollo. So you can imagine, uh, if you think it was just, um, he's a partner, you know, financial institutions group in New York. Uh, yeah, like mom and dad, like mama, I like dad, I should say, still works for Apollo, still doing a great thing. And that's the way it goes. So pay attention to the kids, where they're at, and see what you can avoid. Uh, I used to work for Goldman Sachs as well. Go figure. Uh, it's not hard. But let's talk about Zells. Now, before we get into this, I'm going to go ahead and give you guys a chance to get a drink because I know I need to drink after talking just straight like that. I'm going to tell you guys something. We're going to focus on Zales for a reason. Um, you guys know previously I touched on it. I said, hey, man, everybody coming from Zales ends up, they were all at Apollo. Apollo, that's one of their first deals. They bought all the bonds in 91. They managed to force them to go to bankruptcy. Then they put their plants into place. You know, you plant, and, I'm, and I am literally quoting Leon Black, you plant your seeds, you maximize value, and then you exit. When did they ever exit Zales, though? That's what I was asking myself after reading everything. And it kind of tells me exactly why I followed the path all the way to Bed Bath & Beyond. But we'll get there. Uh, but let's go ahead, guys. Let's go. Here's chapter two, I guess, of this show. First one was Drexel Burton Lambert. I wanted to show you all the connections so you guys understand how loyal it is and how big the network is. So um, I won't be drinking that. Let me see. What's cold around here? There we go. All right. Zales Jewelers. If you've ever worked at Zales from 1994 until about 2014, I question you. I want to know who you are and what you're doing. So let's go for it. Um, first, how do you get to become an um, independent director? These, I actually got a lot of this from different companies, but the prerequisites are one, you are not employed by the company within the X amount of years, usually about three to five, not employed with the company independent auditor, not affiliated with the company and or advisor and consultant of the company, not affiliated with significant customer or supplier, not employed by a public company at which an executive officer of the company serves as a director. So all of these things have to come into play before they put an independent director on the board. Reason why I tell you this is the way you get past all of these bylaws is all you have to do is connect who's at the private equity firm. So it's so easy for Apollo to put people into all these different companies and then for all the naysayers out there to say, well, they're not connected. What do you mean? They've never worked for Apollo. They've never worked. There. They're not supposed to work for Apollo. They're literally supposed to be independent and away. That's why you have to connect these dots. But don't worry. I'm here for you. Let's go. Zales. Hi, this is Robert Di Nicola. In 1994, Zales was actually forced back to the world by Apollo. And as you see it, there was another deal that happened in 1994 that people are not talking about. It was the Macy's deal. Macy's, which was federated, combined with federated, was a leftover deal from uh, Drexel Burnham Lambert. If you guys don't remember, we talked about it in the past. That's where it all started. But as you can see here, Mr. Bobby Nicola, Robert J. D. Nicola, actually worked for uh, Bon, I believe it's called Bon Marchi. I don't really know how to say the words. Uh, bon March, if that's how it is, but I say Bon March because it has an E, uh, which was a division of the Federated Department Stores. He's also worked for Rich's Department. That's also part of that. So this is all part of everything where they actually... Uh, merged with the May Company, and which ended up being Macy's. Okay, so he worked for them before he ever got to Zales. The minute he got to Zales, you knew. Well, I felt that he was a plant from that standpoint. Um, here's the Macy's plan merger with Federated. That actually happened in 1994. So out of bankruptcy from '92, they actually combined. So anyone who has since worked at Riches, Bon Marchi, and or Macy's. I'm, I'm all ears. And federated, I go, okay, I get it. That was part of that deal that came through Drexel Burton Lambert, ended on the on the chest of whoever owned the bonds. And I'm telling you, it's probably Apollo at this point, but I don't even have to go that far. I'm going to show you exactly what happened. So 
chairman CEO Bon Marchi, a division of uh, you know Federated Stores. He was at Zales. Everything. This is when he officially retired in 2000. Now, when he retired in 2000, you got to remember he didn't officially retire. He actually came back again. He came back to the same company in 2001. He was chairman of the board. He had additionally sat as CEO of GNC when Apollo bought them, Linens and Things when Apollo ran them, and he did Claire's as well. Okay, so we've done that in another video. Beryl Raff was the next CEO. Beryl Raff comes in. She comes in from Macy's, if you guys didn't know that part. But she was actually appointed by Alan Shore. And I was like, okay, I talked about Alan Shore last video, but it didn't make sense until now. Alan Shore. Alan Shore actually owns and he runs a company called The Retail Connection. And The Retail Connection, um, they are commercial real estate. They have contracts with everyone and everything. So you can imagine the influence he currently sits with knowing that he has Kohl's, Bed Bath & Beyond, Nordstrom's, Cons, David's Bridal, Tuesday Morning Signet, Party City, Joanne, and Bye Bye Baby. This guy runs it all. So he was part of Zales as well, chairman of the board for Zales before he ever went this route because I feel they have the whole spectrum covered. But maybe that's just me. Beryl Raff, the second CEO. How you doing, hon? Uh, Beryl Raff right here was uh, chairman and CEO of Zales. You guys know that. In 94 for a reason. The uh, reason why she came over in 94 is because of the Macy's deal, right? She worked with Macy's the minute they formed and they merged. She got out of there. It was a federated store now owned, and she went over to Zales. That's where they put the plants. That's just me. As you can see here, she goes ahead and she steps down. She was 50 years old, and she states, uh, resigned to spend more time with her family on personal interest. Guys, that is not true. I have since seen one of her interviews last year where she stated that she had a huge brawl in, a, in, a, in one of the meetings that they were going to basically make her take the fall for the company underperforming and she didn't want that said on her name and that's unfortunate because that's the way it rolls for them like adam aaron literally would be like yeah we're underperforming we're terrible he'll talk his way out of it she couldn't she didn't want that but did she stop working for apollo that's what you have to ask yourself when that's all said and done and i'm going to say no because she later on and went ahead and did a private equity deal um, she worked for Academy Sports. She was on the board of directors with them. They were sold out and bought out by KKR. Additionally, she was board of directors for seven years for Michaels. And Michaels was bought out in 2021. And that was by Apollo. Okay. So when they sold that, remember, you put your seeds in place. Once they go ahead and finally get back to you, um, that's how this works here. Now, they were sued because they actually agreed for $5 billion to sell off to Apollo. And the investors sued the board of directors because they claimed the company was worth more than the $5 billion. And uh, yeah, so she's no longer there. Now we'll go to the next CEO. And that's, you know, Beryl Raft on two. After she left, it was Robert D. Nicola went back. And Robert D. Nicola went ahead and retired again. And now you have right here this young lady by the name of Mary L. Forte. Mary L. Forte is the one on the right-hand side. You see her picture. On the left, that is Sue Gove. How you doing, Sue? Looking young, where did Mary come from? Guys, I glossed over this the first time, not the second time. She used to work for Bon Marchi. She also worked for Riches. And, of course, those are all federated departments um, now that they've merged. So that's where she came from, and that's how she ended up here. Uh, she worked for the May Company, 13 years of merchandising for Macy's. So you can imagine how it's planted for her. If you look here, they want to thank Robert D. Nicola for his service as chairman of the board. Who's on the signature block? Mary Air Forte and, of course, Sue E. Gove. Now, if you look over here, Richard Marcus will assume the director of the chairman of the boards. Guys, Richard Marcus. Yeah, that Marcus. I know. I know what you're thinking. But we'll get back to it in a minute. So here you go. Board of directors, guys. I pulled this one from a filing from 2003. This is going to be all the people on the board of directors, the independent directors for Zales. Mary Forte, Sue Gove. Robert D. Nicola, Peter P. Copsies, that is Apollo. That is Drexel Burnham Lambert. Sue Gove has been working with Apollo for a long time. She knows exactly what it is. Richard C. Marcus, who is Marcus and Neiman? Neiman Marcus, I'm sorry. Neiman Marcus filed for bankruptcy. Do you know who ran that bankruptcy? We'll talk about it later. That was Apollo. Andrew Tisch, this is the last name on this list that drove me wild. I said, what the hell is he doing there? He's the guy in the picture on your left. I said, no way. I know Andrew Tish. I read the name. I read the name because the Tish family owns Lowe's Corporation. That's Lowe's Cineplex. This guy right here was on the board of directors in 2002 with Zales. Three years later, he would sell his family business to AMC, which are the movie theaters. 
Who owned AMC at the time? Apollo. This plant was already there. If you guys don't know, his dad and his uncle died 2003, 2005, respectively. In 2005, what did they do? They sell the damn company to AMC. That's Apollo. So you want to know how it all happened? It happened right here at Zales. And guess who's there? Sue Gove is there. Peter Marcus is there. Richard Marcus is there. Peter Copsey is there. And so is Andrew Tisch on this board of directors. So that's a direct tie. If you guys can't ever tie one up, you guys need to know. But we'll go back to it. Neiman Marcus takes over. But before Robert De Nicola retires, he and his wife, they sign a deal with Sue Gove and you know Zales. They actually um, fronted the money for their house. I think it was like $2.6 million. I, I saw the whole deal. I just grabbed the bottom of it, but I uh, posted in the Discord. Um, so we'll go right here. After you go through this, the Neiman Marcus deal is like a big deal to me because you know that it was just planted for them. Uh, Forte resigns as CEO of Zales. And they named Burton as the new CEO. Now, Burton is the interim CEO. Betsy Burton is the interim CEO right here, this young lady. She's so young when she passed away. Um, she was 68 years old. She's from Palm Desert, California. That's right next to where I live. It is so close to home, and it's unfortunate when I read this. She was a CEO of Zales. She worked for Tower Records, guys, CEO of Tower Records. That's private equity involved, if you ever read the story there. The UNFI private equity uh, involved as far as what they offer and what they do, and I'll show you. Staples, there's another whole story there. Uh, Sports Authority, that's private equity. GNC, do you understand? It's the same people, the same things for all these plants. If you guys want to look at what UNFI is, UNFI is what she's on the board of directors for. They actually supply most of the food for Sprouts Farms. So the Sprouts, the Sprouts Farms market who Apollo owns and launched in 2013, you can imagine she was on the board of directors for the supplier. So how are you on the board of directors for the supplier and yet you still work for the parent company? It's it's all indirect, right? It's just too much for me at times. But you guys can read this whole slide if you'd like. Uh, right here is the next board of directors for Zales. If you guys are paying attention, I'm sorry, the next CEO right after her uh, was going to be this young man. And this young man died, unfortunately, but he was part of Victoria's Secret's L Brands. So L Brands, that's the uh, Leslie Wexler um, Wexler um, connection. If you guys know about Leslie and Jeffrey Epstein and Leon Black, that whole connection, it's it's terrible. Um, but that's why Leon Black's not here anymore. But as you can see, this gentleman here, um, rest his soul, he was the president of the Children's Place, which filed for bankruptcy. Remember, we talked about this. The CEO of Zales as well and Limited Brands and Gaps, and Victoria's Secret. He probably would have had more if he hadn't passed away. The next one is, this is the next CEO, Theo Killen. And I don't know if that's how you really say his name. I'm just saying he's a killer. What's up, Killian? Allegedly. G uh, Theo, how you doing, man? Uh, let's see. R.H. Macy's and Company in 1975. Macy's. You get where I'm coming from with this guy? You get where the plant comes from? But if you go ahead and look at his career, he's worked at Tailored Brands, Claire's and Macy's and Zales. So you mean to tell me you're on the board of directors deal for tailored brands? That's Sue Gove as well. And you're also the CEO of Zales. I can, I can imagine what's all in common there. But I'll let it just sit, you know, as a coincidence as people tell me. Rance, he's got so many coincidences. Do I? How about Zales puts up 12 leases on New York stores up for sale? Now look at what it says. A source familiar with the matter... Last month, told last month that they would, uh, the private equity firm Apollo Management was considering taking a stake. No shit, Sherlock. They own damn Zales. They run Zales. So you're basically going to sell it to yourself. I don't know what to tell these guys. Um, next director, the next CEO, remember, they have since merged with Signet Jewelers. Zales has. And now I have, I see this young lady by the name of Gina Drosis. I think I say, say her last name. But Gina has, Private equity written all over her before she ever got there. These are her two companies. She actually executed the strategic sale of Assurex Health uh, for $410 million. But I couldn't find anything on Gina. I'm like, Gina, Gina, what else? You know, It's because her name's not Gina. <laughs> her name is Virginia, and I found her at Foot Locker. Now, yes, she still is the CEO of Signet Jewelers, but you don't think she's private equity? I'll play with you guys. And by the way, if you ever want to invest in a Foot Locker, no, um, I'm not doing it. That's all I'm going to tell you. Here's Foot Locker, guys. You ready? Hang on to your seat. Foot Locker, this gentleman here, where does he work or where did he work? Vitamin Shop. 
February 2016 to December. Didn't get what he wants. Now he's here. Alan Fidman, where did you work? GNC Holdings. I wonder why. Next one. This guy, Mr. Payne. Mr. Payne, where did you work? You were the CEO of Milwaukee Brewers Baseball Club. CEO of Milwaukee Brewers. Who owns Milwaukee Brewers? Anybody remember? Go look at the beginning of this video. Mary Ann Dillon, currently on the board of directors at KKR, right here. You could read the whole thing. I'm just reading you the best parts. Rosalind Reeves, how you doing, hon? I don't know about this hair. I really don't, I don't mean to talk, but I'm just saying. And what does she do? Human resources leadership positions at AMC Movie Theaters, Dollar General, and Sears. <laughs> yeah, no, I'll pass. All right, so I'm not going to go with Foot Locker. We get that part? Cool. We know who's involved? Yeah, I got you. I want to show you guys something here. 2013. 2013, board of directors here for Zales. These are all the names involved. When I look up at the top, I look at Terry Berman. Terry Berman, currently Abercrombie & Fitch. Terry Berman, private equity ties the whole way through. Kenneth Gilman. Kenneth Gilman, former CEO of Asbury Automotive. Ask Sean Goodman how that worked out. So Kenneth Gilman has ties to that. David Dreyer. David Dreyer, he actually is going to be Chico's. Oh, hey, remember that, okay? And then Beth Pritchard, Pritchard, Pritchard. I don't know if that's how you say it, guys. I don't know these names. Beth, how you doing, Beth? That's what I want to focus on for a minute. Beth at the bottom. Independent directors, guys. Beth, how you doing? Let's see Beth here. She worked for L Brands because that is Bath and Body Works. She was CEO and president of Bath Body Works, L Brands. She worked for Albertsons. We know the deal already with Kroger and Paul. Borders Group. If you know Borders Group, uh, that was um, Bill Ackman. Bill Ackman bought out Borders Group uh, about within a year after she left. Vitamin Shop, she's still there, 14 years. Everything is private equity driven. That's what I'm trying to show you with Beth. Another person I want to highlight is called Susan Lanigan. Now, Susan Lanigan, this had me think twice. Had me think twice, Susan, because I read here that you were the Zales Senior Vice President and General Counsel. But it also said on your bylines here that you worked for Chico's. And I'm always wondering, guys, like when people are way outside of their spectrum of, of their work environment, like why the hell does Sue Gove go work for automotive when she's jewelry? I've always like wondered this stuff. And and don't worry, I'll tie that one. But let's go look at Chico's because you worked at Chico's, Susan Lanigan. And I saw Chico's earlier. I saw it when I looked up this guy right here, David Dreyer. I saw that he worked at Chico's. So it kind of like triggered me. I said, all right, I'm going to go into Chico's now. So here's Chico's, guys. And the first name that pops up is Andrea M. Weiss. I said, wait a minute. I know that name. Yeah, I do. She's on the board of directors right now for Bed, Bath, and Beyond. In addition to that, you have... Um, as I go down the list, I want to make sure I have everybody here. Did I read some of my homie here? I can't remember. He worked for Blooming Brands, but that's not the one that I cared about. He worked at Michael's. There we go. <laughs> worked at Michael's stores. This guy right here, um, Mahoney. And then David Dreyer here, of course. You saw him all L brands out. Um, or Tommy Hilfiger and whatever else he worked at. But uh, I'm not worried about him because he's at Zales for damn sure. And J. Crew. Hmm. Uh, we'll go here, though. Board of Directors at Chico's. William Simon. Hey, Bill, how you doing? I remember you, Bill. I remember you because you're on the board of directors for GameStop and you're with KKR and Ryan Cohen kicked you out. But now that I see you over here tied up with these guys, I really get it. But I didn't get it as deep as I do. I read here that you used to work for RGR Nabisco. Anybody know about the Nabisco deal with Drexel Burnham Lambert? That's a real deal that happened and they made billions of dollars off of it. This all makes sense now. You should not be here, Bill. You shouldn't be in women's clothing apparel at Chico's. You shouldn't be in GameStop, but you're a plant, and I'm happy that we pushed you out at GameStop. Chico's, huh? <laughs> Ridiculous. Now look at all the rest of them. This is all Chico's here, guys. I don't know why I put in this bottom part of down here about Smart and Final. That doesn't really matter. But they were at L Brands before. Um, this individual's L Brands. The next one is going to be Aeropostale, uh, part of the, the mall connection. And as I go through, I want to know why I put certain people on here. I think it was because of Michaels. They've been at Michaels before. And Taylor and um, The Gap, things like that. You see Michaels again. There's Michaels. I'm just showing you that everyone over at Chico's was private equity, basically. And it's just unfortunate. So Zales Corporation announced the resignation of their executive vice president and chief operating officer, Sue E. Gove. Guys, Sue E. Sue, how you doing? The company would like to thank Sue for her many contributions over the last 25 years. Guess what she's learned? 
She's learned it pays to be part of the private equity connection. Oh, she's learned this the, the great way. So Richard C. Marcus, how you doing? That's the guy who's chairman of the board. I said, Neiman Marcus? Let's go check out Neiman Marcus, guys. If you guys don't know about Neiman Marcus, here you go. Um, the CEO right now, Boston Consulting Group. Yeah, I know. Says it at the very bottom. Also, L Brands. There you go. The CFO, Katie Anderson. Where did she go to school? UCLA Anderson School. Um, I know. The Morales Company right here. Morales. I don't even know how to say the name. That's a uh, Drexel Burnham Lambert connection as well. But it's cool. We just let anybody in these companies. Pauline Brown. Where does she work? Starboard Value Acquisition Group. Yep. I know all about it. She went to school at the Wharton School of College or Business, whatever. She used to also work at the Carlisle Group. <clears throat> Private equity, guys. Written all over it. Go to the next one here. City Trends. I've had that one pop up before, Pamela. I remember that part. This is L Brands as well. So L Brands, City Trends, you name it. Next la young lady here. I forget where she worked. Uh, Bain and Company. There you go. Bain and Company. Thank you, Chris Miller. Uh, Mika. How you doing, Mika? Uh, where did she work? Bed, Bath & Beyond. She worked for Bye Bye Baby Operations. Wharton School of Business. So they already had their plant in place. She did Party City. Uh, plenty of bankrupt companies. They did their part. So good job doing that. And this one's from uh, the Pacific Investment Management Company. Uh, PIMCO. Done plenty of deals with Apollo. This is all private equity driven, all sitting there. And why do I tell you about this? Because Neiman Marcus Group announces board member resignation. Now, who retired and who got out of there? His name was Mark Billingson. And I told you about this, this deal here. He faked a heart attack or a fake injury. They said that he was going to have a heart surgery, heart failure, recovering from a successful medical procedure in the coming weeks. He should have a full recovery. That's what he should have. But what did he do? I want to have uh, undergoing emergency heart surgery last week. You really think he did? I don't think he did, but that's just, you know, neither here nor there. Um, I do know that he got kicked off the case because he was, he went to court and the judge asked him a question about Neiman Marcus' business model and he knew nothing. And the judge said, listen, if you bring a guy like this again to me, I'm just going to throw out this bankruptcy altogether. And that's exactly what happened. And I read all about it. Um, if you guys don't know who Mark Billingson is, the guy who's faking the heart attack over here, um, he's Apollo through and through. Fisker Automotive. Um, Lowell's, he's been with it all, guys. This guy's done everything you can think of with Apollo. He's on the board of directors right now for Apollo and Athene, right, which is part of their, um, he did Caesars. He was a part of the Caesars uh, core acquisition as well. So that's just connections all the way through. Now, this is the jewelry department for Signet Jewelers. They're now $7 billion. And I tell you why why everyone was looking at diamonds back in the day. Uh, diamonds were where you were going to make money in the 90s, essentially. And I think this is how Blue Nile came to about. You had Nordstrom's. You had Neiman Marcus. They all sold diamonds, guys. They all sold jewelry. A lot of them did. But Zales found a way to take over this market. There was another company out there, and I don't even have the clip for it, guys. I'm just going to tell you the information. There was a company out there called Friedman's Jewelers. I was in Savannah, Georgia at the time. I was aware of them. They went bankrupt while I was there. And I saw them close down the stores and do all this stuff. And uh, sure enough, there was an individual from Zales, uh, one of the senior officers, her name was Pamela Romano. You guys can go look it up if you want. Um, she left Zales to go over there and manage that bankruptcy from 05 to 08. She was there for three years. And during that time frame, a company by the name of Harbinger Partners went ahead and invested money. They went on later to sue Apollo for $2 billion in a failed investment the same year in um, Sky Technologies company uh, called like Light. Saber something. I was going to put it on this video, but it didn't matter because it was just so, it wasn't tinfoil, but it was so left field that I was like, man, did they really give them $2 billion to invest in? It's just go look it up yourself if you guys want to see the history on it. You can. Now, how do you stop private equity, guys? This is how you can stop private equity. This is how you can shut down the whole firm. Uh, right here, the elevators at the 9th West 57th Street, which is the Sal building, right? You guys are familiar? I've showed it to you before. Um, on the 42nd floor is KKR. On the 43rd floor is Apollo. On the 47th floor is Silver Lake. Or Silver Lake's on the 32nd floor. I apologize. Providence is on the 43rd floor. And as you can tell, they're all in the same building. Well, the elevators went out one day, and everyone was stuck in their building. In addition to that, Payne Weber is going to be there in that building uh, coming up that next month. And Sika, Sika, what is that? Sycamore Ventures, same thing. 
Guys, it's a joke. It's a joke. You can't stop private equity. But that, for that day, they did stop them with an elevator prank. Now, we're at the end of this. It's called Revisit the Story. I tell you guys this all the time. I try to revisit the story, why I'm invested, why I'm involved, or why I give you guys a heads up. I want to revisit this story called Bed Bath & Beyond. Numerous people out there are trying to tell you it's going to do something that it can't do. Um, I call bankruptcy. I told you exactly how it's happening. I tell you they're going to carve out the assets, sell it all off. Uh, they don't have a stocking horse as of today. They have a deadline to meet. The 22nd of May, we should have known, we'll know everything. 22nd of May of 2023, that is the year. Today, it is April 29th. So we have some time to find out what's going on. Bed Bath & Beyond files for bankruptcy protection after a long struggle. Now, I want to talk about Sue Gove for a minute. You guys know how I feel. I just showed you that she's worked with Zales Corporation for 25 years. She was the executive vice president. She was second in charge of everything that went on around her. She's Apollo's person, right? More than not. But it looks like she went ahead and found a way to navigate through bankruptcies and make money doing it. And this is why I read the tweets from Ryan Cohen, from Larry Chang, who tell you executives that are overpaid and not doing the right thing and or failing their companies. And this is one of them. And this is not alleged. This is, there's never been a company that she's been involved with that has uh, done anything productive. And Bed Bath Beyond is no different. But I wanted to review something back because I couldn't understand why she was in AutoZone. And everyone's been trying to tell me, well, she's been on board of directors for X, you know, all these other companies. And when I read up on AutoZone, it said that she had 18 years with that company. I can only track 15, but I want to show you guys something. Something you guys should know about Sue Gove. Sue used to work for AutoZone. And when she went to AutoZone, she was assigned a board of directors in 2005, from what I could see. And Sue was there, executive vice president. She was with Golfsmith International Holdings. You know that she got Golfsmith liquidated and sent through. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But look who's on the board of directors here. And what jumps out to me was here, William Crowley. And if you know about William Crowley, he's the ESL Investments, Inc. He's the president and COO. In addition to that, uh, she got... On there with Robert Gutsky, whatever his name is, but Hope Capital. Well, all it means is private equity swept in on, on them. So when you look at ESL Investments and who Eddie Lampart is, is it Lampert? Lampert. He actually is the individual that was at AutoZone. He was the director of AutoZone from, two, from 1999 to 2006. But if you know, his company still stood on the board of directors there. Private equity was involved with their transactions throughout the whole time frame at AutoZone. And they've gone through numerous people. But if you know who that is, who the ESL people are. She just happened to magically appear on this board the minute they took over and or they shifted responsibility elsewhere. Uh, he's the same guy who ran Sears. He sold Sears to himself and destroyed the whole company from within. If you guys ever want to read that with how it worked out, Eddie Lampart is like one of the worst investors for the, you know, for the retail investor. Um, you lost all equity. He's under investigation all the damn time. Uh, not a good guy. Allegedly. This is all alleged, guys. I don't want anybody coming after me. I'm just letting you know exactly what Sue Gove was tied into while sitting here at AutoZone. Okay? They were all together, private equity, at ESL. Same time frame, same hiring date, same everything. You guys got to go read about it. I read all about it. Now, Golfsmith. Let's explain Golfsmith to you guys and what happened. Golfsmith was purchased by auction, at auction, by Dick Sporting Goods. Okay, any remaining golf spits, blah, blah, blah. Read this. Hillco liquidation purchased approximately $80 million of golf smith inventory for approximately $8 million. They got they got 90% off. They sold everything. Hillco, if you know, that's exactly who's in charge of the liquidation process for Bed Bath & Beyond right now. She's done this before. When she got hired, she got hired with Marty Hanukkah. Now, Marty is, is well known, guys, for his sex exploits. Um, he was having an affair with his secretary when he worked at Staples, and it was a big deal. It was a big deal because she was trying to frame him for like $10,000 a month or something to that nature. Uh, Marty got a bad rap, and Marty couldn't get back on the map. And what did they do? They put him at Sports Authority. Remember, I showed you Sports Authority and who's owned that. Plenty of people involved here as far as private equity goes. Uh, they went under, and as they went under, he came back from it. He went to Golfsmith International as well, became chairman and CEO and um, so now you know his connection. Sue Gove is there as well. And it's just unfortunate. They get hired together and they go together. Like they pair them up together. Here you go. Here, we're going to put a woman next to you. And if you guys know the influence of private equity and why they use women now more so than ever, uh, that's, that's my next video, I guess.
Guys, let's draw it all back. Okay. Drexel Burton Lambert, very deep ties to private equity still today. Up to 72 professionals still exist out here on this world, and they are at the heads of all these companies. They have plenty of individual supposed plants that they have put on numerous companies. I've drawn the line in the sand to tell you whenever I see the name of private equity next to somebody's byline, I go, okay, they're with that. That's where they come from. That's what their nature is. Their nature is not to see the company succeed. They're not trying to make you know shareholders any value whatsoever because the value is not in it for you. They don't work for you, shareholders. They work for their company, the private equity firm. There are some great people out there. There's some VCs out there that invest money. And when they do that, they want the company to make money. They want to go public. And when they do, they want to continue to make money via dividends and payouts. You name it. That's what they want to do. But some of these companies that you guys need to avoid and or that I will avoid moving forward are the ones that are influenced, manufactured outcomes by private equity. And it's happened for the last 45 plus years. Drexel Burnham Lambert's the problem child for that. But when you do leverage buyouts, you do SPACs, you do all of the things that they do to go public again and or to get, gain leverage of the board of directors. It's it's hostile takeovers. Sure. It's venture. It's vulture capitalism. Absolute. But I'm telling you what it is, guys. It's connecting the dots. I wish you all the best of luck, guys. Hopefully you got the information that you didn't have before. Maybe you make some choice decisions when you're thinking about companies you want to invest in. But before you invest, please don't just look at the ticker. Don't just look at what's happening on a weekend. You know, oh, this company acquired this. Or they go find out why and find out who's involved. Follow the money. It's so simple. They've been telling you this for centuries. GameStop. That's where I'm at. I'll see where you guys are. GameStop. Can't stop. Won't stop. GameStop. Let me see you around, millionaires. I appreciate you guys for hanging out with me. Connecting the Dots Part 19. Maybe next week. Who knows? I'm a little tired. Peace.